Okay, um, good evening. Um, my name's Steve Greenoff. I've, um, I'm head of ICT at Stoke Danville Community College, um, but I've also since January been working with an organisation called Computing at School, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. My, um, my role now within Computing at School is as a South West Regional Coordinator um, for the Computing at School organisation um, to really liaise with um, other members of Computing at School um, to promote CPD opportunity, particularly for existing ICT teachers who need to make that, that transition into, uh, into computer science specifically. Um, so that's really my, my role within computing at school. And I wanted to come here today just to really um, introduce computing at school to you, introduce what, it, what it's there to do and what it stands for and hopefully to try and get your support as well in some of the things that we, we plan to do over the next 12 months or so. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background information first, um, just up on the screen at the moment is um, computing GCE entries, which is A-levels to you and I. Um, and this was one of the problems, is that w computing A-level started to plummet about 2002. Um, and the last set of figures show obviously there's a, there's a real decline now. I think in terms of gills entering uh, computing A level, there's 300 of them in the country. So it was really, um, it was really becoming a critical point. Um, and it was from this really that computing at schools um, began. And one of the problems that, um, that kind of compounded this was this statistic here. So in 2003, the ICT A level came into play, um, and suddenly you get 28,000 um, students taking computer science at A level. ICT comes in at A level, and suddenly a, a, a raft of individuals who perhaps would have done computer science picked up ICT A level, um, and the numbers started to plummet from, from there on in. But at the same time, subjects like maths A level went up. Um, so it was really from that that in 2008 CAS was first formed and it started off very small, um, just really as a collection of individuals who were quite keen on computing, quite keen on computer science and promoting it. They had a little bit of funding from companies like Microsoft, uh, but very small um, and just with a kind of desire to kind of make, make a change and improve things. Um, but it quickly gained momentum. So in 2010, uh, it actually joined up with yourselves, the British Computer Society, uh, but also companies like Microsoft and Google. And it started to get a bit more gravitas, and, and people started to take it a bit more seriously. Um, further on, you move on to 2011, there was a, there was a, a report from Nesta, um, which made several recommendations, some of which are actually coming into play now in schools. Um, things like bringing computer science into the national curriculum, that's something that's that started to happen at quite a fast pace. Um, sign up the best teachers to computer science through initial teacher training and, and use, use of golden hellos. And I think if I remember correctly, BCS has actually provided some of the funding to do that. Um, and also obviously including computer science as one of the English baccalaureate subjects. So computer science now is tied in alongside the more traditional sciences of chemistry, physics and biology as part of the English baccalaureate, which is a qualification that students get at GCSE if they achieve um, five or more GCSEs in English, math, science, a humanities subject and a language. Um, so a lot of those recommendations um, from Nesta have started to kick, come into play now. Um, and I think since then, lots of people in industry started making comments about computer science and programming. I think programming kind of became a bit trendy again. Um, and you had this very famous quote from Eric Schmidt uh, in 2011, where he said he couldn't understand how schools weren't teaching computer science. We weren't teaching our students how to program. We were focusing far too much on a curriculum that looks at how, how to use software uh, and how to create solutions to with software, but actually not much of a, not much of a focus on, on the uh, computer science aspect. Um, and this was, this was uh, compounded by other people in industry saying similar things about coding as well. Um, and then in last year, last January, uh, the Royal Society produced a report, and this got sent out to every single school in the country, um, looking at 
the issues around computing in schools and computer science in schools, um, and it made the recommendation um, that computing should be introduced to replace ICT um, and have ICT rebranded. Because I think what, ha what had happened with ICT, it got a bit of a bum rap. Um, people had kind of lost a bit of interest in it. It was seen as a, as a subject that was really just you know, using software and it had kind of lost, lost some, of its, uh, some of its appeal. Um, so trying to rebrand it as something potentially a bit more exciting, a bit more engaging, um, seemed to be the way to go. Um, and then everybody's favourite education secretary um, popped up uh, last January at BET and, and talked about computer science. Um, and actually he, he said lots of, uh, lots of things that were probably true about ICT, about how it needed to change, but he was actually quite complimentary of computer science. You know, he saw it as a rigorous subject, um, he saw it as a, as, as a really key subject for the 21st century, um, but he just felt that actually ICT wasn't really doing the job. Um, and then at BET he announced that the ICT curriculum would be replaced. Um, with a computer science program, which, um, which we're now calling computing, and I'll, I'll get on to that in a moment. Um, so there's a lot of press around this about IT being scrapped, and there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of misrepresentation saying that actually no kids were going to do ICT in the future, but it wasn't that. It was, it was about changing the, uh, the subject, hopefully for the, for the better. Um, so just going back really to computing at school, because, you know, computing at school as a result of all that really started to gain a lot of momentum. So January in 20, 2012, it actually got funding from the Department for Education to recruit what it was calling master teachers. Um, and it's a post that I took up uh, in January of this year. And the term master teacher, I can't quite kind of get my head around too much. It's not a term that I particularly like because you, you go into school with 20 other teachers and say, I'm a master teacher, and it's not the, the greatest icebreaker in the world. Um, but really what it is is someone with a, a particular interest, a particular focus um, within computer science um, where that person feels that they can contribute something and provide some opportunities for some professional development for other staff. Um, and initially, Computing at School got funding for just under, under 30 master teachers, and across the whole country that, that hasn't made much of a dent. What they also did last March was they produced their own version of what they saw as being the computing curriculum before the Department of Education uh, produce their own, they actually produce their own sample curriculum um, and they called it a curriculum framework for computer science and information technology and if you compare the two side by side, the curriculum framework from CAS and the, um, the program of study from the DFE and there are some quite startling uh, similarities as you probably expect um, but that was developed in partnership with yourselves at British Computer Society. Um, then last September um, CAS launched the Network of Excellence, um, which was a network of schools, universities, interested parties, different organisations, all with a focus on computer science. Um, and then later worked with um, yourselves at the BCS and the Royal Academy of Engineering and, and helped to feed into the draft curriculum programme of study um, for schools. Um, moving on just to earlier this year, um, we got the draft curriculum from, uh, from the DfE for computing, and this is going to start in September next year, so we've, we're just under a year away from it being introduced into schools. Um, now, Kazi's response, I mean, you can see some of the quotes from, from the response to the consultation there, and I won't read it, read it out for you. Um, but generally, they were quite excited about the new curriculum, I think that's fair to say, but what they were very concerned about is that actually there's a lot of ICT teachers who have come from different backgrounds. Perhaps they've, they've taught other subjects previously and they've been teaching for 30 years. Um, and they haven't got the skills and expertise to deliver this computing uh, programme of study yet. Um, and what uh, CAS were really concerned about is actually if you, if you introduce it too quickly, it's going to get a frosty reception. It's not, gonna be, um, it's not going to be 
delivered in a way that's engaging for students and we end, off, end up in a similar situation to what we had with ICT where students become a bit, a bit detached from it and they don't really, uh, they don't really respond to it in, in, the sort of, uh, in the way that they should. Um, but regardless, the computing curriculum was released um, a couple of weeks ago actually um, and that's a final computing curriculum now, so we can really see what it is that, that teachers need to deliver from September. Um, and that was released right through Key Stage 1, which is sort of 5 to 7 year olds, right up to Key Stage 4, so GCSE age. Um, but alongside that, to be fair to, to the Department of Education, they did spot a, a need really to recruit and train um, you know, and upskill existing ICT teachers, and they provided funding to CAS to do that. Um, now, the plan is over the next five years that we go from 30 uh, master teachers initially to around 600. Uh, we start developing links more and more with the university, and we're doing a lot in the southwest with Plymouth University um, on that. Um, and actually producing a, a really good set of classroom resources that teachers can take away with them and deliver um, that's actually been produced by people with, uh, people with a good understanding of computer science, people with a background in the field, um, and just really boost that, that status of computing in schools. So that's, that's really the plan. Um, but going back to the network of excellence, it's really kind of gained momentum recently. Um, we've just got over 6,000 members now on the CAS website. So that's 6,000 individual teachers signed up on the Computing at School website. 771 schools, 208 what we call lead schools. So these are schools that, that see themselves as being able to spearhead the computing curriculum and, and help to promote and deliver CPD. Uh, 75 universities, we've got a, a network of regional hubs, there's one in Plymouth, there's one in Bristol, there's one in Bath, um, and those regional hubs are a great, great place to start bits of CPD and to, to get that networking going. Um, 78 master teachers and, and really a whole host of sort of interested parties that have sort of come on board as well and you can see some of the, some of the parties in the network of excellence and, and willing to contribute so it's, it's really gained momentum. So just talking briefly about the, the master teacher program um, as I hate to call it, um, it's funded by the Department of Education, it's backed by companies like Microsoft, AQA and OCR that are both exam boards. Um, and the real plan with this is to get teachers on the ground delivering face-to-face -face CPD to their colleagues in other schools um, to prepare ICT teachers for, for the computing curriculum. Um, there's 78 in total now, 64 in secondary schools and, and 14 in primary. It's the same old story with the South West, so you always have this tiny little splattering covering a, a massive geographical area. Um, so I think this blue dot here is me, and then we've got one, two, three, four master teachers for the southwest, and we've got three primary master teachers as well. So we're quite well represented in terms of primary master teachers, um, but still a bit thin on the ground if you look at other areas of the country as well. Um, but we're getting there. So what have we done so far? Well. Previously, up until um, very recently, I was the sole sort of CAS representative in the South West. Um, and I, just, I started really just trying to organise some CPD sessions, um, seeing what people would respond to. So I started off, um, the big focus always seems to be when you talk to teachers, they want to know how to programme. That's the kind of key element. And I think, I think that's probably the case because programming is not something you can just teach on a lesson-by-lesson -lesson basis. You really need to have those fundamentals in place. Um, it's not a case of picking up a textbook and doing some exercises. You need to really kind of, you know, be a bit of an expert yourself before you can teach others. Um, now, I, um, I came here about seven years ago, and I did a computer networking degree. I was never really very good at programming. I, it wasn't something that hugely interested me, and I could do it in dribs and drabs. Um, so everyone was saying to me, we need programming CPD. We need someone to teach me programming. So I picked up a book from the CAS website, downloaded one, and I, I started to teach myself Python. I'm not an expert at it, but I taught myself just enough to... Um, 
to get me through a CPD session and to, to pass on some information. Um, I did it down in the southwest. I did two four-hour sessions. I did a morning session and an evening session on different days. And we had just over 30 delegates in total, um, which I was quite pleased about for Plymouth and for the southwest. Um, it seemed to be quite popular. Um, then in July, I did um, a CPD session, which was more of a workshop based on how to design a computing scheme of work uh, and Shirley attended that and did some, um, some bits and pieces on um, JavaScript um, and, hack and looking at source code on websites um, and again that was really well uh, populated, I just did the one session there but there were 30 delegates and um, I had a maximum of 25 and then slowly, uh, slowly the numbers started creeping up um, so those are, the CPD so far has proven to be really popular, and this CPD has been paid for CPD. They haven't paid, teachers haven't paid a lot for it. I think we charge about twenty, thirty pounds a session, um, but it shows that actually there's a desire to attend these things and to, um, you know, and to for teachers to upskill themselves. Um, we've also got two. We've also had two CAS Hub meetings. We had one in January, one in May time. I've just been talking to Shirley about the next one, which we're hoping will be before Christmas. Um, and this is really the staffing on the right hand side. I don't know if you know any of these people from your other uh, from your other links or anything like that. Um, you've got myself there as regional coordinator. We've got six secondary master teachers. Quite nicely spaced about in in the southwest. Uh, and then there's three primary master teachers as well. So we, for the first time really, we've got quite a good covering of people ready to help deliver CPD. Um, so that's really where we are with CAS. Um, and what I'm really after today is some support in hopefully delivering some CPD. Um, and I want to talk very briefly about the new computing curriculum because I realise I've been been harping on about this new curriculum and you've probably got very little idea what's included uh, and it probably makes more sense to you than, than some ICT teachers. Um, but coming from a school I was, um, I was, I was producing a, um, a poster for our, um, for our main sort of corridor in the street and I was doing that thing that I think lots of people do where they look for inspirational quotes from people on websites and I think as a teacher this kind of summed it up for me it's um, Dick Costello who's, who's in charge at Twitter if you can program a computer you can achieve your dreams a, com a computer doesn't care about your family background, your gender you, you just know that just that you know how to code I think for a lot of our kids that's, that's quite a kind of aspirational thing I think there's, there's a real desire there from some of our kids to to actually learn to program. Um, they see it as quite a trendy thing to do and they enjoy doing it. Um, for the first time I've got um, some 14 year old computer science GCSE students um, and it's the first time I've ever had students really take work home with them and actually have a really good effort at doing work at home and developing their skills at home. I've got one student who comes in every week and says, oh, I did this at home and shows me, shows me a load of Python code and, and everything else. So, um, so there's a real desire from kids. So you don't get that a lot in schools. Maybe you, know, you get kids who, are, who are, want to be premiership footballers and they'll go and play Sunday league every, every week and they'll go training twice a week. And I think programming has that hook um, for some kids. So I'm really looking forward to the new computing curriculum. Um, now I mentioned computing and computer science and ICT, and this is probably the best way that I can sum it up. We now have a, or we will now have a computing curriculum from 2014, and within that computing curriculum there's a, there's a few elements. Um, you've got your traditional information technology or ICT strand, um, which is getting less and less. Um, but you've also got a, a fairly large chunk of it now is computer science. But I think underpinning that, particularly at primary schools, you've got this idea of digital literacy. So students actually understanding how to use computers um, and how to stay safe on the internet. That's a very, a very important thing. Um, and then probably elements of, of what, what's probably best called technology enhanced learning. So actually not just in terms of our computing curriculum, but actually how do students learn outside of the classroom using ICT. Very popular at the moment, things like Khan Academy and, and, 
um, Apple's, um, Apple's university channel on iTunes. I know lots of universities now are publishing all of their resources free of charge. And I think um, in the days where it costs £9,000 to come to university, um, I should, probably shouldn't be saying that here, but that's a very real consideration for students. Lots of people are actually learning to program in their own time using resources developed from some of the top universities in the world and, and learning other subjects as well. Um, so the, this is really, I found this on the internet, this is um, a kind of comparison of ICT and computer science and you probably know this anyway yourselves, um, but it, I think it just kind of summarises the, the real key differences between what we perceive as ICT and what, uh, and what we perceive as computer science. Um, and I guess the way that I describe it to kids um, is in ICT you learn how to use a computer, whereas in computer science you learn how to make a computer work. And I think that's probably, for me, that's the principal difference. Um, so just moving on to the computing curriculum, what I've tried to do is highlight in red the elements that are probably more computer science and then in green the elements that are more ICT. So, I mean, you look at key stage one, we're talking about five to seven year old children now. Um, you know, some of the computing aspects, I mean, we've got to create and debug simple programs at five years old. Um, by the time they hit seven, they need to create quite simple programs. They have to have sequences of instructions. We're talking about if statements now, and we're talking about loops and, and all these types of things. And also a bit of an understanding into the whole networking side of thing. Um, probably some logical reasoning there as well, and understanding what an algorithm is. So quite advanced at quite a, an early age. And then moving on, when you get to the secondary curriculum, there's probably even more computer science. You're talking now about Boolean logic, and you're talking about hardware and software components of a computer system. You know, I came to university here, and I learned about you know, AND and OR and, and logic gates and all this type of stuff in my first year at university and we're now teaching it to 11 year old children. Um, so things are moving at quite a fast pace. Um, and obviously you've got the green bits there, but quite a small part now of ICT, we're talking about creating creative projects and reusing digital content um, and staying safe on the internet and that's about all the ICT there is. Um, now, at Key Stage 4, the, the, the criteria, there's a lot less, really. And that's really because at Key Stage 4, uh, it's a bit more straightforward. Students will either pick ICT, um, or they'll study ICT, or they'll study computing. Um, and they'll either do that at GCSE, or they can follow, follow various vocational routes. Um, but uh, across the board now, a massive, uh, a massive focus on computer science within the computing curriculum. So, why do we need CPD? Well, I found that statistic there at the top, and I found that quite, um, quite scary, really. Um, only 22% of ICT teachers believe they're capable of writing basic programs. So, if we go back to our key stage one computing curriculum, what we're saying there is about 22% of teachers can, can do what it asks students to do when they're five years old. Um, so, there's a real issue there. And also, just under 20% of teachers have a computer science related degree. So, lots of teachers are coming to ICT from different areas, from different backgrounds, and it's about upskilling those teachers. Um, so, really, um, I wanted to kind of finish with a plea, I guess. Um, really looking forward this year to delivering some high quality CPD in a variety of topics. Um, and working with people like yourselves, but also links with, with some of the local companies around people like the Met Office and Plymouth University, um, to try and encourage, um, encourage a bit more computer science CPD in the Southwest that teachers in the Southwest can, can attend. Um, as I said before, programming is a, is a massive one. Um, probably alongside that, Kodu, I think, is a very popular one in primary schools at the moment. Um, the Raspberry Pi has kind of taken the world by storm a little bit, and I think it'd be good to, you know, to get on the coattails of that. I know the Met Office are very keen to, to get some stuff going there with things like weather stations, and some of the stuff you can do with Raspberry Pi seems to be amazing. Um, 
looking at computer hardware. I'd love to see sort of build a computer workshops and perhaps bringing kids into various places to get them to have a go at building their own computers. It's kind of what I did when I was 14, 15. I broke half a dozen computers and finally got one working. Um, but that really kind of whet my appetite. I think things like Lego Mindstorm, um, very popular in primary schools at the moment, but not really used to its full effect. Um, I'd love to get into things like app development. I think if you've you know, if you want to try and get kids hooked on programming, what better way than to get them to create apps for their own mobile phone? Um, I, you know, there's a real sort of enterprise aspect of, you know, putting your putting your apps on the App Store or on the uh, on the Google Play Store. I'd love to see something like that happen. Uh, perhaps something along the lines of networking as well. I think actually networking's massive at the moment. Um, purely, purely and simply because of things like Xbox Live and PlayStation Network. And I was talking to some, some of my students the other day who wanted to host a LAN party and we were talking about all the equipment that they need to get in and about what types of switches to get and whether they should have wireless routers and whether they should wire up their houses. And, and, you know, and we talked about crimping your own network cables and all this type of stuff. And they're genuinely interested in, in things like that, more so than making pretty things in, in PowerPoint sometimes. Um, and anything else, really, there's probably a whole raft of things that, that, have, that I've never come across. Um, and if there is anything that you think, no, you, you need to be doing this in schools, I'd love to hear about that. Um, so that really kind of concludes what, what I wanted to say. Um, Please, if you do have any questions, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but I'm really looking forward to uh, hopefully developing some links and, and getting some really good CPD and, um, and getting, that, uh, getting that CPD off the ground. So thank you very much. Right, okay. Um, I'm John Evans, okay. Um, and I uh, run the PGC program for computer science with a local provider called um, the Learning Institute. Um, and kind of, again, reiterating what um, Steve has said, uh, this is the first year now starting with this cohort, okay, of uh, PGC being computer science. Before, it's always been PGC, ICT, Information Communications Technology, okay? But for the first time this year, it's a PGC in computer science, okay? So, I mean, how I drifted into that, I mean, I came from an IT background. I went to the university here at Plymouth. Um, I did a computing course, uh, and then I went into industry, went into systems analysis, business systems analysis, data analysis, etc. And then I kind of lacked a bit of challenge, and so I thought, mm, what I'd like to do is a PGC. And I did a PGC, the closest thing for me, which was ICT um, at the time. Now... I found probably quite soon afterwards, actually, what I was is like a glorified media teacher, really, uh, which is a bit of a surprise to me. Um, and then I ended up uh, teaching business studies. And business studies became more popular at my school. And to be honest, even though I had trained PGC, ICT, um, my skill set was actually more attuned to being a business studies teacher than it, than it was uh, an ICT teacher. So... But then I ended up uh, doing, running the uh, PGC ICT and now the PGC Computer Science program as well. And um, it is difficult. Um, but now we're looking for trainees who have a computing background, not trainees in the past where they've, they've come from a media background. They're not going to be uh, you know, of so much interest to us uh, anymore. So I'm going to talk about um, what the routes are if you wanted to go from industry into education. Okay? So let's say you're interested in doing that, it's a route you wanted to take, yeah? uh, what you'd need to do. You'd need to spend some time observing lessons uh, in uh, a school. Okay? That's fundamental. Yeah? Now, how much time you spend actually depends on the route you take into it. Okay, and we'll look at different routes uh, later. Uh, you have to have uh, GCSE grades C or above in English and Maths. And uh, for primary, you need science as well. Uh, the logic is sound. 
in that if you are teaching children, you need to have a basic understanding of literacy and numeracy, okay? Whatever subject you are teaching. So the logic behind that is sound, okay? Um, now, if we do have trainees who sometimes lost their certificates um, or never retook their maths or never retook their English, and then we can provide equivalence testing for that, okay? Or well, some providers can, we do, okay? Um, if you're going into education from uh, a graduate route, you need uh, the equivalent of uh, a 2-2 uh, honours degree. Uh, equivalents are taken as well, so I doubt any problem, for example, there would be any problem with the uh, BCES uh, HE qualifications at all. Um, and you need to pass professional skills tests again it's so important, literacy and numeracy, okay? It is crucial with young, young children, whatever subject you're teaching, okay? And you have to pass skills tests. Now, and that's a change for this year as well. Before, um, you do your QTS skills test whilst you were training to be a teacher, but you couldn't get your qualified teacher status unless you had actually passed those skills tests. And we had a training year this year, it's quite sad, um, had done everything necessary but couldn't get the, the QTS skills test in English because um, she, her English was, you know, uh, a second language to her. So it's really unfortunate. But now uh, you actually have to have done these skills tests before you can start doing uh, a teacher training course. Okay? So um, I think probably that's a pretty good idea, to be honest. Right, so let's look at, you've got the... Uh, what you need to, to be able to start thinking about it. Now look at your different routes into it, okay? Uh, there's an undergraduate route, and for that you need a Bachelor of Education degree, okay, B.Ed. Or um, you can have a regular honours degree that actually includes QTS with it, Qualified Teacher Status. But I'm not aware of that many degrees that actually have that. I don't know if, can you answer that question, Shirley? Do we have any degrees here at Plymouth that actually have QTS along with it? So you're doing a regular honours degree programme and then you bolt on QTS with it? Apologies, uh, a question for Pete Yeomans. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what happens in the other faculty, to be honest. Does it depend on the subjects as well? Yeah, they would be quite interested to talk about that yes. sometime. Yes. <laughs> um, because I wasn't aware you could do that. But apparently there are some honours degrees, and you can actually get QTS, bolt on QTS, as a part of your degree programme. Um, there's the postgraduate route, and there are different ways of going into it from a postgraduate route. There's what we call a SKIT, which is a school-centred initial teacher training programme, okay? which means basically most of your time is spent in a school. Okay? Now, you've also got uh, the higher education route, which is uh, a PGC, Postgraduate Certificate of Education. Okay? Now, our PGC program at the Learning Institute is actually a school-centered PGC program. So our cohort of trainees started last week on Monday, and they'll be off into school on Monday, next Monday. So it's just two weeks, and then they're in school. They're not necessarily going to be teaching lessons uh, in two weeks, but they're going to be in school. They're going to be observing lessons and they're going to be seeing how it happens. And I went into teaching through the higher education route. I didn't go into a classroom probably for about two months. So, to be honest, I prefer getting into a classroom sooner. Personally, I think it's best to get into a classroom sooner. So I think the school-centered approach, personally speaking, is the best approach. Okay? But you can do higher education PGC. Um, now, as I said, our program is a PGC, but it's actually school-centred. Okay? Now, the government are starting something called School Direct. Okay? And I'll go into that a bit in a minute. Uh, and School Direct, okay, as it stands, you go, you go to a school directly and you spend most of your time at that school. Okay? And that goes with QTS. You have to have qualified teacher status. Okay? But... And you might be able to get a PGC along with that. That depends on your provider. When we're doing School Direct, we've just added the bolt-on so you can actually do a PGC with it. Now, um, looking at the PGC, 
okay? Postgraduate Certificate of Education. It's actually two levels. When I did it, there was only one, which is a level seven postgraduate certificate in education. But there's also a level six, okay, which is a professional graduate certificate in education. So the level seven is the master's level, whereas level six isn't. We normally do an initial assessment of academic writing when we have trainees uh, join us and then decide whether to put them on uh, a level six or a level seven, progr level seven program. Doesn't matter a jot as to, you know, the grade they leave with as far as being a teacher is concerned, okay? So the PGC can be primary or secondary, or it can be what we call PCE, which is post-compulsory education, which is uh, further education and such like, okay? Now, uh, the secondary route always used to be the best route to go for in terms of you could go down and work at primary, and you could also go up and work uh, with further education as well. It was always used to be a bit of difficulty with um, teachers who trained or with the further education route, post-compulsory education. Uh, that gives you qualified, um, uh, qualified teacher learning and studies or something, and you actually couldn't uh, go down to secondary school. Um, but I think that's actually changing. But there's going to be... I can imagine you're getting difficulties in terms of getting a job uh, if you're moving back from FE to secondary. Okay. Um, right, so that's your PGC. Now let's look about the Schools Direct. It is pretty new. Okay. Uh, it can be salaried or it can be funded by loans or bursaries you know, as a normal school centre route or PGC would be. Now, the idea with the salaried uh, school direct, that's, that's largely aimed at people maybe who are working in a school, maybe acting as a teaching assistant, etc., or an unqualified teacher, and that school direct is a route for them to get the qualified teacher status, okay, with the school that they're actually employed by. Or it could be a case of um, a school wants to recruit a teacher from industry and they're going to train the teacher themselves, uh, get them qualified teacher status, okay? And that could be via school direct route, okay? Uh, it says minimum of three years work experience. That doesn't necessarily mean three years work experience in a school. That's three years work experience in, you know, whatever industry you're coming from. Um, in terms of from the government approach and them driving uh, Schools Direct, there is an expectation of employment at the end of it. Now here lies a, probably a fundamental pro a problem with uh, this program because head teachers aren't necessarily going to be in a position to recruit maybe one year in advance. Okay? So it's going to be very difficult. They're not necessarily going to know if they're going to have a position one year down the line. So it's quite a difficult one for them to, to actually do that. Okay? Uh, the selection procedures uh, for uh, somebody uh, going for the school direct route um, is going to be more rigorous, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, and you normally need more in-school experience for schools direct because the idea is uh, you're going to be able to hit the ground running, so to speak, a lot quicker than you would if you're going in via this Schools Direct route. Now, with this Schools Direct, you'd be spending most of your time in one school. There would be a requirement for you to get the qualified teacher status that you'd spend some time in another school, but it's only going to be a minimum amount, a couple of weeks. Okay? Uh, that's different from a school centre PGC or a regular higher education PGC because you're going to be in probably two different schools. Okay? And if you're going into a secondary school, more often than not, that you'll be expected to do at least a week in a primary school as well. Because uh, the transition from uh, year six, the end of primary, to uh, start of secondary, year seven, is a big one. And we can see students drop. So that transition is really important. Okay? So it is important for secondary teachers to have had some experience of what's happening in a primary school. Okay? Uh, so, moving on. So, uh, all routes lead to qualified teacher status, or I said qualified teaching, 
qualified teacher learning and skills, which is the uh, QTLS, and that's the post compulsory education route, the further education route. Okay. Now, um, so fees do apply for training, which is generally about uh, nine thousand pound. Okay. Now, in terms of what you can get, the grants and stuff that are available, um, for as far as computer science is concerned, okay, PGCE, computer science, um, you get a bursary of £9,000 if you've got a first class honours degree. Uh, if you've got a 2-1, it's uh, 4000 and it's nil point for a 2-2. Two -two. Um, now, there are industry incentives as well. So the BCS are very generous, trying to get people in teaching computer science. Uh, I don't know what the position is next year, but for this year's cohort, um, there was, uh, I don't know how many places they had, but it was a, a scholarship of £20,000 to get people from uh, industry into education. So it was quite a major incentive there offered by the BCS. But that was for this year. I don't know what's happening next year. I mean, sadly, you know, in terms of numbers for computer science, um, I had three last year for IT, computer science this year, first year it's running, PG computer science, only one training. Okay. Uh, incidentally, for physics, chemistry and maths, if you've got a first, the bursary is £20,000, which is uh, quite phenomenal, but obviously computer science isn't as considered as important as physics, chemistry or maths. don't know why. Right. Um, right, so what might you have to do, okay, if you decide to apply for uh, a PGCE program or a school centre program, okay? Um, you'll be observed in a lesson, okay, and for that really it's just seeing how you interact with children. Okay, what we're looking for is people who go around, who work with the kids, take an interest in them, take an interest in what they're doing. What we're not interested in is people who go, ooh, children. Um, so that's important. There's a student interview panel as well. So uh, you'd be interviewed by a team of students who ask you questions about yourself and why you want to go into teaching, etc. Um, and that's quite important. And sometimes we can get an inkling from them that we don't necessarily get ourselves. Okay? Um, you will have a selection panel from the training panel, so that will be, uh, that will be uh, uh, an interview by adults, so that will be people like me and the PGC program leader. Okay? Now, for schools, schools direct, um, it's a bit different. Okay, uh, we'd be expecting you to teach a part of a lesson, yeah. So we might get uh, a group of nice, well, not necessarily nice, um, year ten students, and say, right, we'd like you to teach. I don't know uh, the basics of an algorithm or something like that, or how to do a condition. Okay, and let loose and get them teaching that for about twenty-five minutes. Okay, and that's quite a quite a tall order especially if you've had very limited experience in uh, a secondary school. Um, we had uh, one applicant this year, um, but he didn't really have enough experience in a secondary school. And if you put somebody in that position of saying, right, here's 20 year 10 students, go and teach conditions, it's a pretty difficult thing to do. It's a pretty, it's a pretty tough ask. So you've got to have a lot of experience before you go in through, uh, through that route. And if it's school direct, um, with the potential of employment, although I say potential, but it could be quite difficult, as I say, you might have, be interviewed by the head teacher and the governor as well. Okay. So, uh, local PGCE providers. In the South West, actually, there isn't a lot to be perfectly honest, and it's still quite frightening that despite the fact that there isn't much provision for doing a PGC in computer science, we've, we've only got one. That's quite frightening, really, to be honest. Okay. Um, there's us, uh, University of West of England uh, in Bristol, okay, uh, and uh, Cornwall School Centred Initial Teacher Training. Okay. Uh, March on, used to do ICT, pulled out. 
Exeter, I used to do PC, ICT, pulled out. Okay? Uh, so, you know, that's the only provision, as well as doing school direct through a school. So, you know, our school, Cannington Community College, you can do a schools direct through a school. If, and it's a big if, yeah, they're happy to run a schools direct program for an unqualified teacher to take you through to qualified teacher status. Okay? They've really got to have their eye on somebody that they want taking them through to qualified teacher status if that is going to happen. So that's quite a difficult route to get into. So again, it is quite frightening that there's so little provision in terms of being able to get a PGC in computer science in the first place, but we can't get many people wanting to do it. It's quite frightening. Um, right, so... What transferable skills? And I'm just going to talk from personal experience and the skills that I found stood me in good stead moving from an industry environment into education. Firstly, interpersonal skills, skills, being able to get on with people. That's pretty fundamental, but obviously it's a bit different. In secondary school, you have to be able to get on with young people as well, okay? which is a different challenge altogether. Okay? Um, diplomacy as well. You've got to be quite dip, uh, diplomatic at times. Okay? And I would liken that if I was working in industry and systems analysis, uh, I would always find a certain reluctance for change if I was speaking to users, for example, when I'm coming up with system requirements. I'd always find a certain reluctance for change. And, you know, a lot of diplomacy was involved there and a lot of patience too. Okay? And those are definitely transferable skills going into education. Uh, tenacity, uh, it's just I'm, I'm not the kind of person who gives up on anything. Um, and if you are, if you, if you quit easily, forget teaching, it's not for you. Um, and probably a goal oriented approach. You know, when I was in industry, I was generally working to deadlines for project completion. Um, and, you know, the same thing applies with, uh, in education. But I'm very goal oriented. Yeah? I know what the students have to achieve. These are their target grades. This is what they need to do to get there. And actually, students, when they see that in somebody, they see that you are goal-oriented, then they kind of follow on and think, actually, this is good. This person's got you know, my interests at heart. This person's got the, the end goal in sight. But sometimes, young people kind of lose sight of that a bit. And they need a teacher, somebody to guide them who has got that, who has got a goal-oriented approach. Okay? So, um, those are a few links. Uh, the best one is uh, Department of Education, Get Into Teaching. Okay? So, if you just go to Google, Get Into Teaching, that's the site that it will come up with. And also the Graduate Teacher Training Registry, uh, where you can apply and look for courses, etc. Uh, has anybody got any questions?